at eight. Two strikes and you're out. The new road safety measures to cut down on speeding and dangerous driving. Stevenage, we have a problem. Why NASA could be moving their control center to the home counties. That's what we're talking about on the news hour today. It's Thursday, the 20th of November, 2008. At six o'clock, you're watching the news there. Also on the programme this morning, Joanna Lumley's campaign to give Gurkhas the right to live here in the UK continues this morning when she delivers a petition to 10 Downing Street. She'll be here with the latest on her efforts after half past six this morning. And tonight is the grand opening of the world's biggest man made island, the Palm Jumeirah in Dubai. Ben Shepherd is there and will talk us through the planned festivities and the celebrities who will be there. And that's a little bit later on. Look at that. The weather Incredible. better there than here. Hasn't changed yet, though, has it? It's changing today. Is it? Tonight, really. Some places are feeling the cold later on today. Tomorrow is going to... Most of us were feeling the Arctic blast. So we head through the weekend. Wind chill down to minus 10. Currently, though, it's not a too bad a start. Some of us will be seeing some sunshine once the sun rises, particularly across central and eastern areas of Scotland, down towards the eastern strip of England. Here, temperatures, I'd say, probably just up around 4 or 5 degrees Celsius. Slightly high where we're seeing more cloud overnight and spits and spots of rain anywhere from Northern Ireland down towards Wales. Brighter skies extending across to the Channel Isles. Little change through the day, and I'll give you more details about that wintry weather uh, about 25 minutes' time, Penny. Claire, thank you. Our top story today, breaking the speed limit twice could result in a complete driving ban. That's under new government proposals published today. Tougher penalties are also planned for those who persistently drive whilst drinking or uh, after drinking or after taking drugs. Here's Marcella Whittingdale. Nearly 3,000 people lost their lives on Britain's roads last year. Many of those deaths a result of excessive speed. Today, the government's expected to outline the new ways they hope to crack down on the most dangerous drivers by using a sliding scale approach to penalties. Most motoring offences mean a fine and three penalty points. 12 points on your licence and it's an automatic ban. Under the new proposals, exceed the speed limit by an excessive margin and you'll get six points, effectively meaning two strikes and you're out. So if you do 50 in a 30 mile an hour limit, 70 in a 50 or 90 on the motorway, you can expect six points on the spot. But drivers going just a few miles an hour too fast would incur just two points, meaning four minor offences would no longer add up to a ban. Under the new plans, the drink-drive limit would remain unchanged, although it's one of the highest in Europe. Instead, the government hopes to cut alcohol-related accidents by encouraging people to inform on friends and colleagues who drink and drive. Ministers are also considering whether formal drug limits could make it easier to gain prosecutions. Marcella Whittingdeller. And Priya with the rest of the news this Thursday morning. Thanks, Andrew. Good morning. Retailers hit by the economic downturn are taking steps to boost high street sales. Several leading names are planning to slash prices dramatically to try and kickstart the Christmas spending. Retail figures out today are expected to show a drop in sales for last month. Cordelia Kretschmar is in central London this morning. Cordelia. Good morning, yes. In just about an hour's time, we're going to be hearing the opening bell on something of a first, a pre-Christmas price war. That's when Marks and Spencer stores across the country open uh, and slash all prices by 20%. Already in the ring, some high street giants you all know, Dorothy Perkins, Burton's, BHS um, and Debenhams slashing up to 25% off prices. All these big names preparing to slug it out uh, to fight over their share of every single pound you spend. And in a sign of just how bad things are already on the high street, Woolworths, everybody knows that name, well, they could be sold for just a pound today. Uh, now, while low prices do always mean uh, good news for the consumer, uh, there are some reports that these kind of uh, flash sales, they're being called, are just panic measures, an attempt to clear stock after very low sales. Could they just antagonise shoppers who've already paid full whack over the last few days, didn't know they were coming? Or could shoppers simply, well, wait it out, take their gloves off uh, and wait for even bigger discounts to come later on? One thing no one's fighting over today, everyone agrees, Christmas 2008 looks like being the worst on the high street for many years. 
Cordelia, thanks. Campaigners will march on Downing Street today with a petition calling for the automatic right for Gurkha veterans to live in Britain. Led by the actress Joanna Lumley, whose father served with the Gurkhas, supporters will also attend a massive rally in Parliament Square to demand fairer immigration policies. Despite government assurances, many Gurkhas are being prevented from settling in Britain once they retire. The families of two British crewmen held hostage on a hijacked oil tanker by Somali pirates say they're confident they'll return home safely. The British government has appealed for the immediate release of Britain's Peter French, the chief engineer from County Durham, and James Grady, a second officer from Strathclyde. The Saudi foreign minister says a possible ransom is currently being negotiated with the tanker's owners. Complaints have been flooding into the BBC after a former political correspondent, John Sargent, dramatically quit Strictly Come Dancing. The 64-year-old's departure from the reality show has caused an unprecedented wave of public outrage, with government ministers speaking out. Tiffany Royce reports. So why has John Sargent quit Strictly Come Dancing? This very afternoon he resigned from Strictly Come Dancing. A dream died today. John Sargent... His resignation caused a media frenzy. Even the government like stepped in. He's now the people's John Travolta. The BBC should listen. The moment John Sargent pulled out of Strictly Come Dancing, people began asking if he'd been pushed. Uh, anyone who thinks that uh, I would be lent on or bullied or anything like that, I don't think they know me very, very well. Week after week, his two left feet had seen judges put John bottom of the scoreboard. But the public just kept voting him in. John and Christina. But critics claimed better dancers were losing out as a result and John decided the joke was over. It was time to call it a day. Well, the feeling inside the BBC today is that this was all just a bit of a laugh. Outside, however, the fans feel rather differently. I think it's a shame, really, because, to be honest with you, it's down to the public votes. I'm kind of upset because I actually voted for him. I do think it's very sad he's gone and I wish he was still there. I was actually really upset because he was someone to look forward to just for a laugh. So the viewers aren't happy, but the BBC's insisted anyone who voted for John and feels hard done by will be reimbursed. Finally, some news of our own. From January, a new face will be joining the team on the sofa. It's Emma Crosby, currently a presenter at Sky News. And we're also pleased to announce that Kirsty McCabe is coming to us from the BBC. She'll bring you your morning weather report with Claire from the new year. Let's have a look at what's on our website this morning. We reveal why British teenagers are getting more pocket money despite the credit crunch. Also, how budget supermarket mince pies are up there with the best. And was John Sargent right to pull out of Strictly? You can take part in our online poll. All that and more, gm.tv. Just exactly eight minutes past six. Back to Penny and John. Uh, Penny and Andrew, sorry. Yes, exactly. Well, they did somebody over there anyway. Yeah, yeah. Bob. Uh, Back Bob. to you two. Yeah. Who's Bob? Bob. Is that what you, I can do? Uh, I, called you, I called you John, not Bob. Oh, did you? I don't okay, know who John, Bob is. John, I can live with that. Thank you. Um, uh, do you know what? I love the papers today. The fact that John Sargent's gone off, he's on the front pages. This is my favourite bit, though. This is inside the mail. The backlash as the dancing pig trots off. And that, was that not the funniest thing? I actually laughed out loud when that I saw him dragging a, 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 like a sack of coals. Yes, it was that hysterical. was a classic Paso Doble. It was. He's found his woman and he's taking her home. <laughs> very, very good. There should be a place in Strictly now for somebody who went out earlier, as a matter of fairness, I think. There should be a wild card Ooh. for oh, Sherry, for Sherry. Oh, I thought you were going to say you, Bob. <laughs> no, sir. Okay. Oh, shall I start? Okay. Yeah. Newspapers this morning, then. Uh, independent. Obama brings America in from the cold. This is the uh, Kyoto uh, uh, Protocol Climate Changing Treaty. He says that he is going to... Uh, um, sign up for that, so bring America in from the cold is what they're saying. A uh, big picture of a sign that doesn't really say Woolworths, although it should. Founded in 1909, all that once worth 830 million for sale yesterday mm. for one pounds. Uh, four at-risk children die from abuse every week. Council's not letting fast enough. That's an Ofsted report in the Times this morning and a picture of John Sargent, of course. Same picture of John there and a story we covered in the news. Speeding drivers to face ban after two offences. Although it should be said that there'll be a lot more offences worth two points, so you'll be speeding six times before you... Yeah, it all, de it all depends on how much over the speed limit right. you are. Uh, the Daily Mail has that story as well, speed twice, face a ban, and, of course, John Sargent and the gorgeous Christina, who has got something of the Marilyn Monroe about her. Oh, she's wonderful. Uh, and there she is again uh, on the front page uh, with the dancing pig, and the Daily... <laughs> yes, that'll be a rip to you, excuse me. <laughs> it says, I don't think he looked like a dancing pig. I thought he was marvellous. Uh, January sales kick-off now. Stores just desperate to get us spending.
um, the Daily Mirror, Strictly Gone Cruising, and um, ah, our new and uh, the new person who's going to be joining GMTV uh, on the front there. And finally, a little story in the sun. I had to show you. Look. It's a bunny who's got paralysed back legs and the vet suggested they have it put down, but instead they've sorted out that contraption and, we'll and the rabbit Ethel is now quite happy. And we'll be talking about that a little bit uh, later on. But now we're going to talk about uh, football. Look at this in the Daily Mail this morning. It says, fab finish. Terry snatches winner and Capello is ready to take on the world. Well, John Terry's mistake with Scott Carson, the goalkeeper, almost cost the match against Germany yesterday. It made it one all, but they came through 2-1. Uh, Clive Allen is here to talk football uh, with us this morning. That was a pretty fine victory, isn't it? To go away to Germany and win with that team was very impressive. Uh, without a doubt, uh, I think uh, any time to go away, play Germany. Also, uh, that was a, a fine display for a lot of players who perhaps felt they're not first choice, but they, they certainly, I thought, would have caught Fabio Cabello's eye. Easier to take the blame if you're John Terry for the mistake earlier if you've nodded in the winner towards the end of the match. Yeah, it is. Generous. But, I, but, I, but I do think that was it, it you know, jo John's an, uh, an honest um, player in respect of, of knowing that it was his, his fault. I think he has to take responsibility there. He's the one on the ball. The goalkeeper's waiting yeah. for him to do something. Unless, obviously, the goalkeeper calls for it. We don't know that. Sometimes the ball is just in the wrong place at the wrong time. Uh, Wales beat Denmark yesterday. That is an impressive result as well. Yeah, this is, a, this is an impressive Wales, young Wales side, you have to say, that John Toshak is building. Craig Bellamy uh, scores what was the winner. Uh, fine strike. Um, you know, and he's... He, also he's captain of his country and he will have enjoyed that a, a difficult place to go and play in denmark and a, a fine result for for this young well well side i was up thank you very much indeed for coming in this morning 13 minutes past six drivers who are caught speeding twice could face a complete ban under safety measures due to be announced today the government says it's a more flexible approach to speeding which means the police can focus their attention on the most dangerous drivers marcella whittingdale has this at the moment, most motoring offences mean a fine and three penalty points, 12 points and you're banned. Under the new proposals, break the speed limit by a significant margin and you'll get six points on your licence, meaning it's just two strikes and you're out. So if you do 50 in a 30 mile an hour limit, 70 in a 50 or 90 on the motorway, you can expect six points on the spot. But drivers going just a few miles an hour too fast would incur just two points, meaning four minor offences would no longer mean an automatic ban. Transport Minister Jim Fitzpatrick is here. Good morning to you. So why? Why have you decided to do this? I mean, some would say it was a fairer approach, but why? Well, we're announcing to Parliament this morning a whole range of ways that we're trying to cut down deaths and injuries on our roads. We're killing 2,946 people in our roads and seriously injuring 30,000. And that's the best record we have ever had. Um, we've looked at the reasons that people are being killed and seriously injured, and we see that speeding, drink driving, drug driving, careless driving, seat belts, and um, there are things which we can do to reduce the number of deaths and injuries. So this morning we'll be announcing to Parliament suggestions and a major consultation to bring forward new regulations in the, in the course of time next year, um, and that's what we'll be voting today. See, there will also be people who say that there's too much emphasis on the speeding and catching speeding motorists because it's a, a, an easy way of raising revenue and not enough emphasis on police in cars out there catching the careless drivers, the drink drivers, the drivers who've taken drugs. Uh, and to a certain extent, there's a degree of fairness about that. In that, we need stronger enforcement, and enforcement will be part of, part of the package this morning. However, this is not about raising money. This is about saving lives. The best camera we've got is a camera which doesn't take a picture. Um, the numbers, the amount of money that cameras are collecting now is less than the money we're paying into road safety for local authorities. This is about people who are recklessly, uh, dangerously speeding at excessive levels, and it's not about the ordinary motorists. The vast majority of motorists obey the rules of the road, and they want us to crack down on those who are recklessly endangering others and not obeying and the rules uh, of the but road. But that generally does mean police officers in cars out there catching these sort of yep. people. And that's what's going to happen. We're going to see better enforcement. We're going to close some loopholes. We're going to see uh, new techniques coming in, uh, new technology which will be coming in. We've been testing average speed cameras. Um, the, uh, the, fixed pen the fixed camera is a kind of blunt instrument, but they have saved thousands of lives and reduced serious injuries by thousands also. So they're playing their part in keeping people safe, but obviously they do cause a bit of resentment. 
Um, well, I'm prepared to put up with a little bit of resentment if we're going to save lives. This is about being fair to the motorist who's behaving and driving safely, and it's about cracking down on those who are recklessly endangering others. And, and uh, some of those who are recklessly endangering others are recklessly endangering them because of the fact they've been take, uh, either drinking too much or, ta or, or taking drugs. Now, uh -huh. the problem in the past has always been that the, the difficulty of actually doing a roadside drug test. Has that been sorted? Uh, it's, it's being sorted in that it is an area which is great at the moment under the law we're looking at possibly bringing forward uh, new regulations in respect of that but it's quite clear from the evidence which is coming forward that about a fifth of people who are involved in car fatalities have got an illegal substance in their body so we need to look at that very carefully just as we are looking very carefully at alcohol in the system and the impact that that's having because that's killing hundreds also Jim Fitzpatrick thank you very much 17 minutes past six of the time, Thursday morning. If you're looking for a bargain, today Thanks. could be the day to get one. Many high street stores are slashing their prices by as much as 25% in a bid to entice customers through the door in the run-up to Christmas. Cordelia Kretschmar with this report. They're calling it a guerrilla price war. Well, I tried to get this half price at uh, the Disney store and I tried to haggle it down, but I got it for £9 down from 15 And shoppers can smell blood. I have a percentage off um, for 20% plus I got another 5% off because of the haggling. At Debenhams, up to 25% off everything. Oh, we got a really good deal on the TV anyway, that was 500 off. BHS has staged a flash sale too. Prices have been slashed at House of Fraser and rumours are sweeping the high street of a tit-for-tat sale across Arcadia's brands this weekend. They're all fighting for a share of every pound you spend. In a sign of just how tough times are, this shopper's tactics are to wait till prices come down even more. You need a lot of money, which you don't really have, but it's nice looking anyway. More window shopping around these days. While cut price shopping is good news for shoppers, no doubt, it is bad news for the retailers and apparently for the economy as well. Richard Dodd is from the British Retail Consortium. Good morning to you. Morning. Uh, sign of desperation from retailers? Well, these are very tough times for customers and so for retailers. I mean, our figures show that people are really reining in their spending on a whole range of non-food items. Pretty much the only retail area that's seeing any growth is food. So uh, if you're a retailer trying to sell things like furniture or clothing, big electricals, anything like that, then times are very difficult and uh, you are having to discount in a big way to tempt those hard-pressed customers in. Yeah, is it, is it really a discount or do they put the prices up for a week or so as consumer were suggesting in one of the papers this morning and then taking 25% off the full price? Is this genuine? No, I mean, there, there are actually very strict rules about how you uh, mark and promote uh, discounts and I think customers are not stupid. They know what the uh, regular price of something is and when they look at uh, prices uh, during a promotion, during a big sale, they, they make their own judgments about whether that's good value and I think really whilst it is, as you say, a very difficult time for retail is if you're a customer and you've got spare money that you are prepared to spend then it's a great time to be out there shopping because there are lots of bargains to be had and, and, and stock that isn't shifting is a huge cost isn't it for, for, for these companies so they want it shifting they want it going through the system don't they Yes, it really is about um, stock levels, and particularly as we run up to Christmas, retailers, of course, will be trying very hard to make sure that they've judged uh, their stock levels correctly against demand so that they aren't left with masses of stuff that they have to discount in a huge way uh, after Christmas. Is this unprecedented, having these sort of sales now? And what will the effect of the January sales be? I mean, should people be buying now or waiting for January? Do you expect you know, prices? I know it's difficult to be specific, but do you expect there to be sort of big discounts in January sales still? It's been a really difficult year and things have certainly been uh, gloomier for longer in the run-up to this Christmas than we've seen for a very long time and that's why we're seeing um, big sales, lots of discounts and lots of price cuts uh, going on now, which is uh, a problem for, for retailers. I think if you're a customer and you're thinking, uh, I won't buy now because prices will come down even further as we get closer to Christmas or into January, then you may be judging that wrongly because, of course, uh, as I say, it is all about stock levels and I think retailers will not be in any sense surprised by a difficult Christmas uh, when we inevitably get that uh, and so then won't necessarily be lots of stuff left over no. so I would buy now while you've got the chance. Well you would say that wouldn't you from the British <laughs> Retail Consortium. Have you ever haggled Richard? 
Uh, I have done on occasions, and I believe there's a in lot... In this country, I, I, on the high street. I believe street. there's a lot more of it um, going on. It depends what you're buying, of course. I mean, with some things, you know, whether that's double glazing or a car or something, it's, it's pretty much the norm and expected. Yeah. Uh, if you're in a store, I think you've got to be clear the person you're talking to or trying to haggle with is actually yeah. in a position to, to do a deal with you. But it can be worth trying. I'd like this tie at half price, please. <laughs> I mean, you just sort of wander up and yeah, have a go. Yeah, that probably won't work. work. But for something more expensive, it might be worth a go. Indeed. Thank you very much indeed Thank for coming you. in this morning, Richard. Time is 21 minutes past six. Still to come on the news app, we'll be live to Dubai, where they're preparing to unveil the world's largest man-made island and having a star-studded party. Stevenage, we have a problem. Uh, not a classic Ooh. movie quote, but there's a distinct <laughs> possibility NASA could be setting up shop in the home counties. Dying to find out more about that. Penny loves all that. Yeah, I do. It's all after the break. Six twenty-three. Now, imagine the problem. Your rocket boosters are backfiring, your moon buggy's on the blink, your spacesuit is chafing. Mm. All common problems for astronauts in space, but who are they going to call? Ghostbusters. No, not Ghostbusters. No. no. Oh, Houston? Stevenage. No, Stevenage. Stevenage. Oh. We have a problem. That's what they're going to be saying. We've got a hitch in there. Uh, believe it or not, NASA could be moving to the home counties, and Richard Gaysford is there for us this morning. Beep. Beep. Richard. Come in. Yes, I, here in Hertfordshire on the Red Planet. In fact, uh, well, this is my friend Bridget and Mars Rover here in the simulated area that's supposed to be like the surface of Mars. Bradley in the background, and their brothers and sisters could very soon be back on the surface of the moon. Let me explain why. NASA has this big plan by 2020 to get back to the moon. They're designing all these new rockets at the moment that they're testing to get everyone up to the moon to get scientists there to set up a permanent base on the surface of the moon to run experiments and to have scientists living there but whilst they're there they'll need to talk back to earth and the key link to all of this could very well be stevenage let's find out why with a real life rocket science uh, scientist uh, liz um, seward is with us uh, liz i mean this is quite incredible that stevenage could be the hub of this big moon operation. Yeah, NASA asked for ideas from around the world and we were the European company that replied. And we've recently done a big system called Skynet that controls military communication. And so we think we could do something very similar around the moon and help NASA with all the communication. So you're gonna put satellites around the moon that beam stuff back to, to, to Earth. How's that gonna help astronauts living up there? Well, if you have astronauts there, you need constant communications. And we want to go to the interesting places, so the far side of the moon, the south pole of the moon where you're hidden in craters and you can't see the Earth. So you have to beam your signals to a satellite before they can send them back. It also lets the astronauts wander around with tiny little transmitters on their backs rather than huge things. And it means that they can effectively get internet and television from Earth there as well. They can have some of the home comforts. Yeah, absolutely. And we can see everything they're doing at the same time. And it's really exciting in a way that Stevenage is at the heart of all of this, isn't it? That, that this Hertfordshire town could be the last link between Earth and the Moon. Absolutely. We're Britain's biggest space company. We've got 1,600 people here in Stevenage. And we're working on a really wide variety of projects, including the Mars one at the minute. So. And, and these guys are great, aren't they? I mean, they can trundle around to their heart's content, sending back all this information via satellite. Yeah, definitely. And uh, these are going to be really, really exciting on Mars. They're going to be able to trundle around and think for themselves. So they'll have a lot of data to send back. Well, it is a very exciting project. Fingers crossed that NASA say yes. The talks start today in the States. Stevenage could be playing that key part by 2020, Penny. Richard, that is so exciting. And I want one of those moon buggies. It can trundle around and think for itself. It's better than me on a Sunday. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly right. And yeah. it doesn't need a bloody mirror to keep it going on the same <laughs> exactly. Sunday. Yeah. Right, let's talk about one of the uh, richest countries in the world now. It's got one of the best climates and some of the world's best shops. But uh, why stop there tonight? Dubai will officially unveil the world's first man-made island. This is the Palm Jumeirah. And to continue the theme, the party is set to attract some of the world's top celebrities, including Ben Shepherd. Ben, oh, look, you know, this studio and all that, it's all very well, but that looks OK. How are you? It, it's all right, Andrew. What can I say? It's about 10.26. We're approaching 30 degrees, which is somewhere around 90-something. Look, at anybody's money, it's hot, and it's a beautiful day here in Dubai. As you say, the celebs are in town. When they come to this place, which has become a mecca for the rich and famous, they stay in places like this. The stunning Burj Al Arab. It really is one of the most exquisite hotels I think I've ever seen. An iconic structure here in Dubai. 
and one of the most luxurious in the world. There's going to be one or two more celebs here over the next few days, though. That's because of this place over my shoulder. The Palm Jumeirah, as you said, is having its grand opening with the Atlantis Hotel, and it's going to be quite some party. Uh, it's been designed by Elton John's party designer. It's been The fireworks have been designed by the guy that did the Beijing Olympics, as they say in the East End. These boys know their onions, and quite some onions they're going to be. The celebs... Kylie Minogue is uh, headlining the whole thing. Charlize Theron's going to be there. Colleen Rooney's going to be one of the celebs partaking in the Can Apes, as well as Dame Shirley Bassett. Even Robert De Niro is going to be having the odd glass of free champagne. As you said, Andrew, I've had the tricky job of coming and reporting on everything that's going to be happening. I'm going to be filling you in on all the details, as well as a little bit later on, meeting a family that have decided to make Dubai their home. And on days like today, you can kind of see why. Now, you guys know what these foreign trips are like. Very hectic. Very busy work schedules. If you leave me now, I need to get on with a little bit more cultural research. Yes, and yes. Um, I... Yes. Yeah. Cultural, there you go. Research. And I trust yes. your villa is to your liking, Mr Shepherd. Yes. It's all right. There's not enough maids and not enough butlers for my liking, Andrew, but you can't have everything. <laughs> Speak to you later on. Be down to his shreddies by 7.15. <laughs> yeah. Here's Claire with the weather. GMTV Weather, sponsored by Nestle Whole Grain Cereals. Keep your heart healthy every day. It's hard to follow that, really. It's probably worth uh, jetting off to Dubai if you have a, a free weekend, and probably not to Scotland, where we'll see the first of the wintry weather. It's turning very wintry over the weekend. Today is the last of the mild days, although the cold air has now reached the Northern Isles, and eventually it will sweep right across the country. This morning, the weather is split in the west. We've got more cloud, spits and spots of rain. Showers moving in across the north and the west of Scotland, where it still is rather windy. We're seeing some clear skies across the sway of central Scotland down the eastern strip of England. This is where the lowest temperatures are, mild across the West Country as well as Wales. And then through the afternoon, little change, to be honest. We continue to see the showers in the north and the west of Scotland, turning forever, I'd say, wintry across the Northern Isles. And we've seen some patchy rain across Northern Ireland, stretching across to perhaps even the Isle of Man, down towards Wales, as well as the West Country and the Channel Islands. Elsewhere, you should see some sunny breaks, and that will help temperatures, probably up to, at the very best, 11 or even 12 degrees Celsius. But notice these temperatures across the far north. This is what we'll all be experiencing as we head through the next 24 hours. So tomorrow we'll see some snow showers slowly moving in across the north and the east of Scotland. Eventually then these snow showers move down the east coast as we head through the day. You can see where the clearest skies are. The rain down towards the west country keeping the temperature slightly higher until much later on. See some patchy rain just eventually clearing away from these parts. So this is the picture for Friday if you're heading out. Do remember it's winter, not autumn anymore. Temperatures are going to be in single figures and we will see those snow showers continue with, with a very strong wind coming from the north. So feeling bitterly cold. As we head into Saturday, the snow showers continue anywhere in the north, the east of Scotland, as well as eastern areas of England, uh, down towards East Anglia. That's, I think, where the worst conditions will be elsewhere, clear with some lovely sunshine and temperatures struggling again. And it's all changed on Sunday. Here's your summary. For your local weekend weather, visit our website, gm.tv. Good morning, it's half past six. It's Thursday the 20th of November. You're watching the news on GMTV. In the next half an hour, we'll have the latest on the diplomatic efforts to free the Sirius Star oil tanker and its crew held hostage by Somalian pirates. And we'll be speaking to a former army commander about the likely course for negotiations. John Alumni's campaign to give Gurkhas the right to live in Britain continues this morning when she delivers a petition to number 10 Downing Street. She'll be here with the latest. And dancing full? No. Born entertainer, more yes. like the row over whether John Sargent was right to hang up his dancing shoes is raging on. We'll be joined by two of the show's more capable contestants at <laughs> 10 to 7. Uh, first break in the speed limit twice could result in a complete driving ban under new government proposals out of the day. Tougher penalties are also planned for those who persistently drive under the influence of drink or drugs. Marcella Whittingdale reports. Nearly 3,000 people lost their lives on Britain's roads last year. Many of those deaths a result of excessive speed. Today, the government's expected to outline the new ways they hope to crack down on the most dangerous drivers by using a sliding scale approach to penalties. Most motoring offences mean a fine and three penalty points. 12 points on your licence and it's an automatic ban. Under the new proposals, exceed the speed limit by an excessive margin and you'll get six points, effectively meaning two strikes and you're out. 
So if you do 50 in a 30 mile an hour limit, 70 in a 50 or 90 on the motorway, you can expect six points on the spot. But drivers going just a few miles an hour too fast would incur just two points, meaning four minor offences would no longer add up to a ban. This is about being fair to the motorist who's behaving and driving safely, and it's about cracking down on those who are recklessly endangering others. Under the new plans, the drink-drive limit would remain unchanged, although it's one of the highest in Europe. Instead, the government hopes to cut alcohol-related accidents by encouraging people to inform on friends and colleagues who drink and drive. Ministers are also considering whether formal drug limits could make it easier to gain prosecutions. Marcella Whittingdale with that. 6.33, here's Priya. Thanks, Penny. Good morning. Retailers hit by the economic downturn are taking steps to boost high street sales. Several leading names are planning to slash prices dramatically to try and kickstart the Christmas spending. Retail figures out today are expected to show a drop in sales for last month. Well, Cordelia Kretschmars in central London this morning. Cordelia. Good morning. Yeah, the opening bell rings in just half an hour's time on this pre-Christmas price war. Marks and Spencer opens its doors early at 7 o'clock. They're open till midnight and they're slashing 20% off all prices today. Um, well, Burton's and Dorothy Perkins, all are, some Arcadia brands have already hit back with their own 20% off campaign. And Debenhams, well, they were already in the ring. They're in the middle of a three-day Christmas spectacular sale, they call it, with 25% off everything. So all these giants already slugging it out for their share of your Christmas pound uh, and in a sign of just how dire things really are on the high street already uh, another name you might know Woolworths well they could be sold today for guess how much just one pound now all these low prices you might think well brilliant news for the consumer and usually you'd say yes um, but something about these flash sales these surprise sales whatever you want to call them smacks of panic could this just be emergency stock clearance after very slow autumn sales? Could this antagonise shoppers who've already paid full whack uh, for their products in the last few days? Or could shoppers take their gloves off and simply stay at home, waiting it out for last-minute Christmas bargains? One thing nobody's fighting over, everyone agrees, Christmas 2008 looks set to be one of the worst for many, many years. Cordelia, thank you. Close to 40% of people admit to lying to their doctor about the amount they drink, according to new research. Those most likely to underplay their alcohol consumption are at the higher risk drinkers, those who regularly drink double the recommended limit. Church leaders and the police have launched a joint campaign to remind people of the damaging effects of binge drinking and the effect it can have on families. Britain's leading aid agencies are launching an urgent appeal for donations to help more than a quarter of a million people caught up in the civil war in the Democratic Republic of Congo. Hundreds of civilians are thought to have been killed or abducted during weeks of fighting between rebels and government troops. Sport, and it was a rather big night of football last night for all the home international teams. Matt Arnold was in Berlin, where a depleted England team secured a 2-1 victory. He's just sent this report. In Berlin, a night of celebration for delighted England fans. What can I say about a match? We come to Germany once more. England two, Germany one. Get in there! Fabio Campello! The only sour note, some imbecilic chanting and bottle throwing outside the ground before the kickoff, firmly dealt with by police. England's David James has a much better grasp of sporting values. Uh, it, well, it's great. I mean, we've, we've come to Berlin. I mean, what a. What a stadium to do it in. I mean, I, I didn't get a chance. I'm really annoyed, actually. I didn't go up the stairs and see the, uh, the plaques for the Jesse Owen stuff. Here is that memorial marking this stadium's finest hours. But England's 90 minutes last night weren't too bad either. Finally, some news of our own. From January, a new face will be joining the team on the sofa. It's Emma Crosby, currently a presenter at Sky News. Also, Kirsty McCabe is coming to us from the BBC, and she'll bring you the morning weather report along with Claire from the New Year. Let's have a look at what's on our website this morning. We reveal why British teenagers are getting more pocket money despite the credit crunch. Also, how budget supermarket mince pies are up there with the best. And was John Sargent right to pull, it at, pull out a Strictly Come Dancing? Take part in our online poll. All that and more, gm.tv. It's 6.37. Here's what's happening where you are this morning. Thanks, Priya. Good morning. The main story's here in the northwest. A man's been arrested after the body of a newborn baby girl was found at a house in Warrington. 
Yesterday afternoon, a 35-year-old woman was admitted to Warrington General. It's believed she'd recently given birth. Police arrested a 56-year-old man in connection with the death. He's been bailed pending further inquiries. Family and friends of a seven-year-old killed by a rare genetic condition will pay their last respects at her funeral in Cheshire today. But there could be more heartbreak for Alicia's parents, Christine and Lee Palin Morgan from Ellesmere Port. They've now discovered that their two-year-old daughter Lucy also has the rare heart condition. She was absolutely wonderful. And um, there's, there's a big hole now which will never be filled, but... We've got seven, nearly eight years of absolutely wonderful memories and happy memories and that was what will keep us going. A shopkeeper from Greater Manchester who's been repeatedly targeted by robbers has finally fought back. These criminals got more than they bargained for when Stuart Evans from Middleton picked up a bat. After a violent struggle, the two men were forced to leave empty-handed. In the past, the brave 57-year-old's been threatened with samurai swords. Plans for a £200 million makeover of Macclesfield are being unveiled later today. These are some of the first images of the scheme for the new town centre. It includes a department store, an eight-screen multiplex cinema, a multi-storey car park, as well as shops and restaurants. Well, on to sport, and England's wheelchair tag rugby team are returning from Australia this morning, having won the World Cup with help from several of our region's players. The team includes four members of the Wigan and District Wheelchair Tag Rugby Club. They're all due to land at Manchester Airport, along with the rest of the team this morning. Well, now let's see what the weather's like for the rest of today. Here's John. GMTV weather is brought to you by Olbus Oil and Olbus for Children. Ah. <sighs> The power to breathe, whatever the weather. Good morning. One or two showery outbreaks of rain around first thing. They'll clear away. It'll brighten up. We'll all see some sunshine before the next barrel load of cloud moves in from the northwest later. All in all, though, not too bad a day. It'll be blowing a hoolie down at Hoy Lake, though, from the northwest. A windy old day. Top temperatures 10 Celsius. <laughs> Well, that's the news for the North West so far this morning from the Granada Newsroom. I'm back in around half an hour's time. First, though, we can hand you back to London and the GMTV sofa this morning with Andrew and Penny in London. For now, have a very good morning from all of us here. See you later. Goodbye. Six forty. Let's have a quick look at the papers today. The Daily Telegraph. By the way, John Sargent, uh, everywhere. everywhere on every single paper. The fact that he's actually going. Uh, speeding drivers to face ban after too offensive. That is the headline. The Times. Four at risk children die from abuse every week. And, of course, uh, John Sargent again. The Guardian actually doesn't have a picture of John Sargent on the front. Must be inside. Yes, no. it does. Yes, it does. Oh, right, right down <laughs> at the bottom. Yeah, it's got some sparrows up at the top. And Woolworths, uh, founded 1909, 820 stores, once worth 830 million for sale yesterday for a pound. You could buy Willies. You could, Woolies, you could have your own pick and mix. You can buy Willies. For <laughs> <a> <laughs> <laughs> Woolies is what Willies. I actually said. Thank you very much. Uh, the Independent. Look, John Sargent. And Obama brings America in from the cold, uh, saying that um, the, there's going to be an end to US isolationism over climate change. And Daily Mirror, <laughs> look! It's the man who they called the dancing pig, or the judge of one of the judges, was it? Uh, um, it was, Arlie, it was quite early on. Darling, dancing pig. And also uh, the new GMTV uh, sofa. Excellent. Presenter. All right. Thank you very much indeed for that. 6.41. Diplomatic efforts continue this morning to free the Sirius Star oil tanker and its crew currently being held hostage by Somalian pirates. Among the crew are two Britons. That's Peter French, a chief engineer from County Durham, and James Grady, a second officer from Strathclyde. Their families have released a statement calling for their safe return. Now, according to the Saudi foreign minister, ransom negotiations are currently underway. Let's find out more about this now from Colonel uh, Richard Kemp. Richard, very good morning uh, to you. Good morning. Uh, you've dealt with hostage situations before. How difficult is it dealing with people like this? It, it's highly complex, of course, whenever um, people are, are being held hostage by armed terrorists or by armed hostage takers of any sort. It's always highly complex, um, both knowing what they're going to do and being able to prepare an appropriate response if things begin to unfold in the way you wouldn't want them to unfold. I, I suppose the right start is to talk. It is, of course, yes, I think so. I mean, we, 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 of course, in Britain, don't negotiate with hostage takers. We say. We say. Well, I think it, it's probably true, actually, as right. far as the British government's concerned. 
Um, but, but, but I understand the Saudis are negotiating at present with these hostage takers. And of course their agenda is, is money at, pre at present. This particular group is, is after money. Um, and so I guess the, 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 the most rapid way to resolve the situation is to negotiate and pay the ransom. How difficult a military operation is it to retake a ship of this size? I think it's always extremely difficult, as I, as I say, when you're dealing with armed people who could possibly harm or kill the hostages, although I, I would stress I don't think in this case their intention is to harm them. Um, but I believe on a ship of this size, it's actually relative, it's, not, not, it's never easy, but I think it's easier than it could be in other, other situations. The, the, the um, location is isolated, the target is very, very large indeed, as you know. And so I think our, our, our special forces, for example, and also special forces of other nations are trained to deal with this kind of situation. Insurance companies must be looking at this, I mean Lloyds of London, just saying, well, from now on, I want a full team of military personnel fully trained on every oil tanker like this. I mean, the oil is worth, I mean, I've heard varying reports, but 200 million US dollars, 140 million pounds possibly is on board, and the ship itself. I mean, it's an enormous prize, isn't it, for someone? I think it is, and I think there's, you know, there's obviously you know, wider risks of destabilizing the oil markets if this kind of thing becomes more, more frequent. Uh, and I think also that not, not only in relation to oil tankers, but shipping in general, there's an increasing trend of arming guards and placing armed guards and trained people and sophisticated surveillance equipment aboard these ships. Mm. And there are a number of companies who offer these services. I suspect mostly we're not looking at, um, at government or naval operations, but private security operations developing to provide this kind of protection. Yeah, I suppose the root cause is their fishing grounds have gone, they don't have a stable government of their own and all that sort of stuff, but uh, for the families of the two Britons concerned, that'll be the last thing on their mind. Indeed it will, yes, and I think, I think it's, you know, it's, it's also right to believe that the British government will be looking at every possible option, looking at all scenarios um, in how to help resolve the situation. Whenever British citizens are at risk in this kind of situation abroad, then the British government does everything it possibly can to, to try and, and help. Colonel Richard Kent, thank you very much indeed for coming in this morning. Quarter to seven, you're watching the news hour on GMTV. This morning's headlines, breaking the speed limit twice could result in a complete driving ban under new government proposals outlined today. Leading high street retailers are cutting their prices in a dramatic bid to boost sales. Retail figures out today expected to show another drop in consumer confidence. And Britain's leading aid agencies are launching an urgent appeal for donations for the Congo, where hundreds of civilians have been killed or abducted. Later this morning, the Gurkha Justice Campaign will march on 10 Downing Street with a petition demanding that all British Army Gurkhas are given the right to settle here. Amongst the campaign's high-profile supporters is actress Jana Lumley, whose father served for 30 years with the 6th Gurkha Rifles Regiment. We'll be speaking to her in just a moment. First, Alison Haler explains the history of the Gurkhas' battle to live in Britain. Highly regarded for their courage, hand-picked to serve in the army, but battling for the right to settle in the UK. The Nepalese Gurkhas, who've been part of the British forces for almost 200 years. This month alone, two serving Gurkhas died in action in Afghanistan, but despite putting their lives on the line, soldiers who retired before 1997 are still not guaranteed a home here. Campaigners led by actress Joanna Lumley have taken their fight to the High Court, where in September judges ruled that existing immigration policies were unlawful. But the government still hasn't changed the rules. Protesters insist they won't stop fighting until all retired Gurkhas are given the automatic right to live in the country they've risked their lives for. And Joanna Lumley is here now. Good morning. So in September the High Court ruled that this was illegal, that they should all be allowed to stay here, uh, but the law doesn't seem to have changed. It hasn't been changed yet. I mean, there is still time um, for the Home Secretary to make a final alteration, but we haven't had any indication as to what it's going to be. What the demand is, um, and this has been extraordinary because it's actually come from, we're taking nearly a quarter of a million signatures this morning to Downing Street and it's mounting, they're still flooding in, is that the whole country wants all Gurkhas, irrespective of when they retired, if they've served this country for four years or more, which all of them have because Gurkhas tend to sign up for 15 years, to be allowed the right to settle, if they so choose, the right to work here and the right to use um, the national health for the sort of ailments you get from being old and infirm. And, and of course, uh, and as you, having uh, served this country, and of course for having served this country, how many people are we actually talking about? Because the the, the figures have, have varied wildly. The they've, figures they've that I've fluctuated seen. wildly from sort of. I mean, we've even heard people saying, "Oh, hundreds of thousands <laughs> and little bit." In fact, we've done quite a calculated sort of research into this, and it'll be be between maybe between five and eight thousand men. 
which is, is really which is very small which is very very small added to which I should just point out that all through their service from their pay has been deducted at source tax and national insurance which they've never been allowed to use they've simply been deported before they've been allowed to use national health service or you know the facilities of this country and historically what has happened with the Gurkhas well since 1816 when they first joined forces with us they have fought with us in every major conflict, every major conflict around the world. We've lost nearly 50,000 of them. We must remember that these are Gurkhas, these are our soldiers. They come from Nepal, but they are serving our country, our Queen. They make their pledge with their hand on the Union Jack, facing a photograph of the Queen. They are as loyal as all get out. Um, it seems strangely bitter that a Falkland Islander, who's never been here, has the right to come over to this country and settle. And yet a Gurkha, we have an absolute case of a Gurkha who had his back blown into smithereens in the Falklands, fighting for the freedom of a Falklander, um, is deported for not belonging to this country. He's prepared to lay down his life for the freedom of the Falklander and of our country and is not allowed to, to settle here. And what has your dad said about serving with the Gurkhas? He said they're the best in the world. Actually, everybody, we've had, we've had responses quite extraordinary from all the armed services, from, uh, you know, air, sea and land. We've had re re people from widows. We've had responses from people who've met them, worked with them, from serving soldiers. Across the board, everybody says they are the best of the very best. So what's next then for the, uh, Gurkha, the Gurkha Justice Team? The Gurkha Justice Team, today we assemble in Parliament Square. We have a rally. We have a very moving, very tiny moment at the Cenotaph where the two VCs, there are only nine VCs still living, um, two of the VCs, Tulbahara Pun and Lachman Gurung, very frail in their wheelchairs, will want to lay a wreath at the cenotaph, and then we march onto Downing Street, where we hand in this extraordinary sacks and sacks of signatures of people from this country saying to the government, don't get it wrong, we want the Gurkhas to stay. It is incredible, isn't it? I mean, as you talk about, you talk about men who've won the Victoria Cross and yet have no right to stay. No. Janet, thank you very much for coming in this morning. Thank you. Uh, 6.50 is the time uh, still to come on the news ad. Dancing for one entertainer, what's your view? The row over John Sargent, was he right to hang up his dancing shoes? Uh, we're still arguing about it. We'll be joined by two of the show's more capable contestants. They're next. We're not arguing. Not really, are we? <laughs> and, after, and after seven on GMTV today, how far owners will go to look after their pets, including prescribing a parrot, mm. antidepressants, and fitting a dog, st dog stair lift. Thank you. After the break. <laughs> To you. He's reported live from the Vietnam War. He's uh, Margaret Stead, Margaret Thatcher, right in the eye. We know about John Sargent, uh, but could he have prepared himself for the row raging over his departure from Strictly Come Dancing? Was he right to hang up his dancing shoes, or had he done enough? And it was just all too much. Joined now by two of the show's illustrious former contestants, Quentin Wilson and Kate Garraway. Morning. Good morning. What do you reckon about all this, Quentin? Well, I think it's a bit silly, really. Um, he shouldn't have left. Um, I think you should have just carried on. And look, it's an entertainment show. It's not a dance competition. If you That's want not dance... what the judges say. They keep on saying it's a dancing show and you've got to vote and for the best is, dancers. This is going to come back and haunt them, but they have sort of dehumanised it. It is a hybrid show that you watch and you laugh at, not to look at sequins and taff taffeta and fake tan. Go to Blackpool if you want that. Mm. We can all watch it for whatever reason we want, really. We can, but the most compelling thing, I think, is that you are amused and entertained. And this huge reaction is because we're all gloomy, we're all depressed. And here was this wonderful sunbeam of joy, and now it's been taken away mm. from but us. But you're suggesting that he sort of got shoved out. I think there's a lot of competition. I think the judges were, were merciless. And I think backstage, as you know and you know, Kate, there's this kind of energy that everybody's very competitive because you've got a lot of very sort of capable competitive showbiz people who some of whom have got dancing training. So this amateurism, this wholesome quality that the public really, really likes should be kept in and, 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 and made to, 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 for us to enjoy. Yeah, OK. And, and what's your view on, uh, on this? Do you think he should have sort of stayed with it? Do you think I he think he should have stuck with it, yeah. I think that... Um... 
um, uh, I think it's very difficult. I totally understand what, what, what John was going through because it was a bit crazy for me. There were bits where there was sort of journalists climbing over my back garden wall into that garden. I couldn't leave my house without photographers on my doorstep. And it's bonkers. And you had like debates on, you know, BBC News channels, ITV about whether or not you deserve the right to be in the competition. But um, I, I didn't go because two reasons really. One, I felt people had paid money to vote to keep me in. And because all the producers of the show make it very clear to you that it's set up where you have judges who are mean, nasty and evil, and then you have the viewers who have 50% of the power who have the chance to keep you in. So I felt that I, you know, I had to stick in there really because they'd paid good money to see me there. The other reason why is I do believe in the process of the show. I think people do stick with someone like John or someone like me or someone like Quentin, someone like you, Andrew. You were much better than the two of us, Indeed. if I say that quite but you know, they do stick with you for a while and then and then it involves the process of the show is it involves the dynamic oh, changes God. and bits of my body <laughs> most of you. Bits, I don't say bits of my body were falling apart, but it looks like bits of your body should have been falling apart there. Andy. But anyway, well, you know, the, the bits of my body are falling apart and eventually they think, this girl clearly can't survive, we'll let her go. Or they decide, you know, they decide that they've got bored with the yeah. gag and they let her go. And I think that's the, that's the joy of the show. You know, in the first series you had Chris Parker, hugely popular, star of EastEnders. He made it all the way to the final. And eventually in the final they all went, you know what? Do you reckon he would... I don't think we're going to vote for you. He said yesterday, Quentin, he said yesterday that he could make it to the final and could, and, and could win. What do you reckon? We'll uh, never know, Andrew. No, I we'll think never that's know. And that's going shame. to be the tragedy. And, that's and this shame. is the thing with the format that you don't know what's going to happen. And that's great. And the viewer has this enormous power. And the more you tell them not to vote for somebody, as the judges did, yeah. the more mischievous the voting will it's become. All and that's what and that's what, I don't know if it's choreographed. I think that's a bit mean. I don't think it's planned. I don't think it's set up or fake in any way. I think it's just the dynamic of the show. That's why we love shows like that, shows like X Factor, shows like I'm a celebrity, because you have this four against, everyone gets involved, everyone's rooting for the person. They like and that's the dynamic of the show it's hard for John because of course he spent his career putting the spotlight and grilling other people and yeah. suddenly he found himself in the spotlight and I think that is very difficult I think Fifth. on a personal level I get it but I think it's a shame because we all loved him and it would have been great to see him stay in the show are you wearing an earpiece yeah got to stop we've got to finish oh it's funny um, I, I seem to manage to ignore them then as I usually do I'll just uh, shut 60 percent just under 60 percent of people have said that they don't think that he should have gone so a lot of support here for uh, for, for John Sarge and I wonder if his departure has anything to do with the fact that uh, there's a group dance this week which meant Sunday training for six hours and big training today as well it is hard work I apparently he's got a cruise book as well hasn't he? has he no one wants to miss that good, for him. <laughs> good to see you Quentin are you having a chat with us later I am indeed nice to see you. Uh, the uh, time is, uh, well, it's well, run out of time. What am I talking about? Is That's all for the news now. Stay tuned to GMTV if you felt lost without I'm a Celebrity last night. Kate and Andrew are going to bring you all the latest gossip from Diane Amber, 10 to 8. And Claire with the weather gossip in the mouth. GMTV weather, oh. sponsored by Nestle Whole Grain Cereals. <laughs> Keep your heart healthy every day. Dig out your winter coats because it's turning much colder as we head through Friday into weekend. There will be some snow, particularly in the north of Scotland and eastern areas of Scotland and England, and windy as well, particularly in the east. That's where I think you're going to feel it worse. This morning, then, we're still rather windy across Scotland, where we are seeing one or two showers, particularly in the north and the west. And these showers are of hail across the northern isles, turning more wintry as we head through the day. But further south across Scotland, it's a bright start to the day. We're seeing some sunshine extend down the eastern strip of the country. To the west, though, always more in the way of clouds and the odd spot or two of rain from Northern Ireland, extending it across to the Isle of Man as well as North Wales. More cloud across central southern England, but at least for this morning for the Channel Islands, you should see some sunny spells. Now, through the afternoon, the cloud will thicken across central southern England as well as the Channel Isles. You could see a little bit of rain here as it moves away from Northern Ireland. Elsewhere, those showers continue, particularly in the north and the west of Scotland. We do hang on to the sunshine down towards southeast Scotland, northeast England, much of the Midlands, as well as East Anglia. Now, considering this is where the brunt of the bad weather will be over the next few days, please make the most of the sunshine. So that's the picture weather-wise today. If you're heading out, temperatures will just about be on the mark side still, despite the fact it will be breezy wherever you are. But we can see the cold air slowly digging in now across the far north of Scotland, elsewhere, into double figures and with some sunshine, not feeling too bad at all, although that wind will be noticeable. And then for Friday, well, slowly but surely, the showers will really get going across northern and eastern areas of Scotland. Then through the day, as they move their way southwards, clipping, I'd say, the east coast of England, stretching down towards East Anglia later on, where they will first of all be of rain and then they slowly turn a bit more wintry 
Elsewhere, this area of cloud here will gradually clear away from more central areas, clearing away down towards the West Country. In between there, we will see a little bit of sunshine coming through, but it will be bitterly cold, and that's because of the wind. The wind coming in from the north, gale force winds, so poor visibility, particularly, I'd say, where you see the snow showers over the highlands. Windy elsewhere, and we hang on to that cloud and the rain down towards the West Country as well as the Channel Islands. And this is the picture for Saturday. Saturday continues wintry as does Sunday, and it all changes on Monday. Here's your summary. Check out what the weather will be like this weekend on our website, gm.tv.